Let's see, new software, new applications, new peripherals, new companies. That's what a computer show is all about. And one of the biggest computer shows in the country each year is the Macworld Expo here at the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco. Today, we'll take you inside the convention center and show you the latest and newest products for the Macintosh on this special Macworld Expo edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and sitting in this week for Gary Kildall is George Morrow. George, I'm taking a look at the program here for the Macworld mm -hmm. Expo, and so many new vendors, all kinds of interesting oh, yeah. peripheral software yeah. applications all over the place. No matter what magazine you pick up these days, John Scully is on the cover. That's right. All of a sudden, the Macintosh is hot. What's happening to change this? Well, timing has a lot to do with this, Stuart. You know, I was one of the first guys who said it was crazy to put a a soft drink salesman in charge of a computer company. But in fact, it was one of the best things that happened to Apple. Apple timing, they've been lucky. Everything has happened right for them. Look, in the beginning, uh, when the market was playful, they had Jobs and Wozniak, perfect. Then, just as we're about ready to run out of the hobbyist, along comes VisiCalc and makes Apple sell to the business people. Now, as the market matures, what do they need? They need a marketing guy, Inter Scully. The Mac comes out, could have failed. But the laser printer came along mm -hmm. with, with Scully's skills. The two of them just went together. And then now they're catching the, another wave of new users, work at home, intensive professionals. Their, their timing is great. You can't believe it. George, we're going to go into the Moscone Convention Center now and take a look at some of the highlights of this year's Macworld Expo. When the doors opened to this year's Macworld Expo in San Francisco, it was just a few days from the Mac's fourth anniversary. But to anyone familiar with the early Macintosh, it could have been four decades. The Mac 2's expansion slots and color displays made it the star of the show, attracting a wealth of new hardware and software. Desktop publishing, Apple's modern contribution to printing, was once again prominent at Macworld, starting with software to take advantage of color. Adobe demonstrated its color version of Illustrator called Illustrator 88 that lets the user preview and specify color separations on a wide variety of output devices. To make the program much easier to use, we've added a freehand tool that lets you trace freehand over outlines and the computer automatically curve fits, uh, finds the best postscript kind of curves that match the curve that you have traced. There's the ability to interpolate different shapes given, given two starting shapes. For example, we have a, one of the illustrations over there where it has an S and then a swan, and it interpolates intermediate shapes for you and, and also blends the colors between them. You can do very powerful effects with this, of course. It's a, really a, a nice tool. Adobe also addressed the problem of discrepancies between different screen displays and final output by introducing Display Postscript. What we have done with Display Postscript is take the basic Postscript interpreter that's there inside all of the printers and adapt it for use on displays for interactive terminals. The goal of this is to provide a very high level device independent graphics model for application developers to use. The net effect on the end user uh, is twofold. One is that they, they're getting more powerful graphics just automatically built into their applications. Also the end user gets much more flexibility in terms of their hardware choices. They don't have this horrible situation we have now where you have to worry about do I have the right graphics adapter to run this particular piece of software and if I try to update my graphics hardware, am I going to no longer be able to run my software? All of that nonsense goes away. We're, in a sense, we're coming out of the dark ages in PCs. 
At the Alda's booth, PageMaker 3.0 with color support was on display, as well as a new drawing program called Freehand that combines drawing tools with color, special effects, and PageMaker-like handling of text. For those desktop publishers who have discovered how difficult it is to make professional-looking documents, Hypersoft of San Francisco announced a HyperCard-based DTP advisor. The program offers graphic arts advice on designing and producing documents, covering such aspects as layout, topography, and the printing process. This year's Macworld Expo was awash with color, from monitors to cards to printers. Orchid Technology brought color to the SE with its ColorView board. The ColorView SE adapter displays up to 16 colors from a palette of over 4,000 on either an Apple RGB or IBM VGA monitor. The ColorView card retails for $695 and begins shipping in February. Supermac and Jasmine Technologies were among several manufacturers to introduce 24-bit per pixel color adapter boards. Jasmine's Rembrandt boards can display up to 256 shades on screen, drawing from a palette of over 16 million colors. The significance of 24 bits versus 8 bits is essentially that with 24 bits you can get photorealism on the screen. Um, it gives you a much more accurate rendering of reality. The difference to the eye is that you're able to show very subtle gradations of hue. And, um, and when you look at the screen, it's, the colors are as sharp and as bright and as subtly intermixed as, as um, the eye can see in reality. So really, I mean, the, the metaphor in some sense is that it's looking at reality on screen. Now in 8-bit mode, you have banding because the differences between hues are not subtle at all. And you can actually see them. So there are many, there are many grada the, the gradations aren't as smooth. The Rembrandt boards range in price from $2,000 to $3,000, but most users will need to invest in additional hardware to store the memory-intensive color images. 24 bits per pixel requires 24 times as much memory as a monochrome screen. 4 megabytes of RAM and an 80 megabyte hard disk is recommended to start with, not to mention a color printer and scanner. Still, compared to what is presently comparable, the system might be a bargain. I would say up to now you'd have to spend at least $30,000 on um, very high-end um, super minis and, um, and workstations from, say, Sun and Apollo. In some sense, even the graphics cap capability that we're given the Macintosh is more sophisticated than what you can get on the Sun today. The profusion of color adapter boards was matched by a wide choice of high-resolution color monitors, like the 19 and 20-inch displays from eMachines. These screens measure over 1,000 pixels across by 800 pixels vertically, or two and a half times as much as a standard Mac 2 display. Aimed at desktop publishing and CAD users, the eMachine monitors can display documents at their full height and actual size. Video adapters were prominent at the show, both for capturing and manipulating digitized images. Mega Graphics demonstrated its Megashot frame grabber aimed at desktop publishing and presentations. Megashot can capture images from a video camera or a VCR at 256 levels of gray. It'll be selling for about $1,000. Silicon Beach Software introduced its entry in the category of image processing called Digital Darkroom. The program includes automatic tracing of bitmapped images and special effects for grayscale graphics. Digital Darkroom also features image enhancement for cutting, pasting, and blending dissimilar images. Computer Friends of Portland, Oregon introduced a graphics overlay board for the Mac 2 called TV Producer. The card can lock up to an incoming video signal, which can then be mixed with graphics for special effects. In the race for maximum resolution, Sigma Designs showed its laser view monitors capable of displaying over 1,600 pixels horizontally by 1,200 vertically. The monochrome monitors are designed for publishing and engineering applications and practically eliminate the need for scrolling and reducing images to fit the screen. Apple's new product introductions focused on printers. The three new laser writers feature higher speed, modular design for future upgrades, and networking and expansion capabilities. The two high-end machines called the NT and NTX feature PostScript drivers, while the single-user SC printer uses the QuickDraw graphics routine. Prices range from $27.99 for the low-end SC to $65.99 for the NTX. Apple also introduced a compact musical instrument digital interface, or MIDI, for the Apple IIGS and the Macintosh. 
The connector, about the size of a pack of cigarettes, retails for $99. Now that Apple has accepted the concept of an open Macintosh, products that were once common to PC shows are turning up at Macworld Expo. McPeak Systems of Austin, Texas, demonstrated the first 68030 accelerator board for the Mac II. The board is priced at $19.95, and it's expected to ship in March. A typical application might be um, in a scientific lab where people are doing data acquisition. They're using a computer to monitor a number of instruments in the lab and uh, record data from those instruments. Uh, this can be uh, the process is usually limited just by the amount of data that you can pump into the machine and how fast you can pump the data into the machine. So obviously if you're accelerating that process, you can get a lot more data into the machine a lot quickly and therefore make the whole uh, process in the lab a lot more efficient. Uh, with this card, you might be able to acquire three or four times the data of a regular Mac to in the same amount of time. It's not a typical office product, although we are finding it to have a lot more broad appeal than we had anticipated, and that's mainly because at $19.95 for the basic product, a lot of people uh, you know, would like to go three or four times faster than anything they do. As with all computer trade shows, whether PC or Mac, there were many products shown at Macworld Expo, but few available for immediate delivery. This frustrating but common practice, sometimes called vaporware, was handled in a novel way by WordPerfect Corporation, which has been promising its Mac version of the popular word processor for over a year. WordPerfect was selling beta copies of the program labeled Betaware for $99. When the release version is finally shipped, buyers can get an upgrade to the $400 package at no charge. Finally, in a worthy demonstration of the value of recycling, Sun Remarketing brought out a wall full of the Mac's precursor, the Lisa. The machines are priced at a very attractive $695 and are available for immediate delivery. If the strength of a machine is the variety and value of its software, the Macintosh has proven itself a worthy competitor. Among the new generation of software on display was the area of forms generation. Softview of Camarillo, California showed form system called graphically intelligent software. Once you design the form, the software will maintain graphic consistency when any change in field size or font takes place. In other words, even though you design it yourself, the software guarantees your form will still look professional. Claris, the former software arm of Apple, and now an independent company, showed off SmartForm, another object-oriented program to create forms of all types. And people here are not underestimating the value of this market. Look at the forms market, a market that is a six and a half billion dollar market today in terms of creating forms, publishing forms, and printing forms. And we like to create products that help people in that marketplace and as a result create a new market. A completely different approach to forms generation comes from Spectrum Digital of Madison, Wisconsin. Their product doesn't allow you to design a form, but it allows you to take one that already exists, put it through a scanner, and onto the Macintosh screen, where you can then teach the computer to fill it out. Just tab across to the boxes or lines to be filled in, and the program will even calculate for you. Why reinvent the form? Why reinvent the wheel? Why not make use of existing forms? Uh, there, there are already hundreds of thousands or millions of forms that are in existence, and people want to be able to fill those out, and, and preferably they'd like to be able to use the computer hardware they have sitting on their desk. And that's really where true form fits in. But the real star of this show was Apple's HyperCard. Activision showed two products, Reports, which allows you to generate reports from HyperCard stacks, and City to City, an electronic guide to the best food, lodgings, and other necessities of traveling throughout the U.S. Macromind of Chicago introduced a way to animate your HyperCard stacks. Its VideoWorks 2 HyperCard driver creates real-time animation on a HyperCard application, even in color on a Macintosh 2. 
For those who want some intelligence in their stackware, Cognition Technology of Cambridge, Massachusetts offers Max Smarts, the first expert system shell for a hypercard. In this demonstration, a hypercard application can answer questions and lead you to the correct solution regarding the best way to ship a package. If there's any doubt about the hyper evidence of hypercard here at the show, it's settled here. Throughout the show floor, these computers are running a hypercard guide to the show itself, with which you can locate any vendor on the floor. There's tremendous demand. If you've looked at all on what's going on, the online services, the bulletin boards, the various ad hoc meetings, the user groups, the various things, there's literally a hyper culture that is developing. It's almost a cult. And to service that cult, there are several new publications, including Jan's slick new magazine called Hyper Age. If new tricks are winning friends for the Mac, so are some old ones products that enable the Macintosh to communicate with and run programs for IBM machines. Apple Share PC is finally being shipped, software that allows a Macintosh to share data with popular IBM programs on a network. Tangent Technologies of Norcross, Georgia had an IBM sharing data with a network of IBMs and Macs, but its hardware software package also talks to the new micro-channel architecture of IBM's high-end micros, the PS2 series. But how many businesses are interested in this? Quite a few, because there are in individuals who like the Mac because it's graphics and, and uh, desktop publishing capabilities. There are also applications that have might have been written in-house for the PC only, but they want to share the data. So don't throw away the PC just because you want to get a Mac for someone. Let them work together. For those who need total compatibility, not just shared data, but the ability to run IBM programs on a Mac, there's the Mac 86 board from AST Research, and Soft PC from Insignia Solutions of San Francisco. This is a totally software-based way for a Macintosh 2 to run IBM programs. No hardware needed. And the benchmark Lotus 123 was used as the proof of the pudding. We've tested all of the top programs uh, from, from the very beginning right up to um, Right to today, we've now got 70 programs in a standard test file. We believe we test this product uh, more rigorously than any computer vendor tests a hardware PC. And finally, two other products are worth a quick note. Microtouch of Woburn, Massachusetts, demonstrated a touch screen for the Mac. Instead of a mouse, you use your fingers to command the machine. And a new kind of mouse called Felix came from Lightgate of Emeryville, California. It uses optical technology to make it faster and much more sensitive than your standard mouse. When the Macintosh was introduced back in 1984, it was clearly a different machine than the one we have today. Now, with color, more power, and open architecture, the Macintosh has clearly captured the public imagination as well as their pocketbook. At the Macworld Expo in San Francisco for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Joining us in the studio now is Jerry Burrell, editor of Macworld Magazine, and next to Jerry, our resident analyst, Jan Lewis, and with us, George Morrow. George, you were at Macworld, what'd you think? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm really curious to what you people are going to say to the impressions that I formed there, but uh, it, it was quite an experience for me. First of all, it's, it seemed like a much bigger show than either of the last two uh, computer fairs, West Coast computer fairs, and it's clear that the market in the Mac world, all over the Mac, is just wide open because the big hitters had nobody in their booths compared to some little guys like Wings. Wings, uh -huh. this software program I've never heard of, there were 45 people, 50 people mm -hmm. standing in line. Guys were standing in line for more than a half hour. The fellow at the end of the line had a thing, a card switch. This is the end of the line. If you want to stand <laughs> in line, get behind me. Interesting. Uh, that was really amazing. It seemed like the little fellows were get, had a lot more visibility there. And I think I found a new user. I think Mac is going to catch the wave of a, of a new user, the, the work-at-home professional. Yeah, I think that work-at-home professional market is really uh, getting a lot they of attention now. Over, yeah, but, they, but these people were all over that show. They're kind of a new hacker, but not quite a yeah. hacker. I guess yeah. I'd call them cable 
cable uh, <laughs> competent. <laughs> and cable ready hacking. Cable, cable ready, ready hacking. Right. Uh, and they're willing to experiment with cables and software. Uh -huh. They're not into the hardware. And it seems like this user now is becoming a very prominent feature yeah, I of think a computer user. This user, I think Macintosh is still for the, the little guys, for the um, small office, for the creative types, as well as certainly but being Jim, positioned look, in the in the last care. three years, the American uh, large corporations have gotten rid of three million workers. A lot of these people are still providing services for those corporations, and, a lot, and they're independent professionals now, and they're using Macs. And if the Mac gets in the corporate world, it seems like this is a, an ideal way to come in with that independent fellow. Jerry, do you get that in any of, the, well, any of this? Uh, certainly, uh, the vice president for marketing sales at Apple, Chuck Bosenberg, has said that one of their new focuses is on the home office. We've known that 85% okay. of our readers have had their Macs at home for the last so you know five this years. Wave, mm -hmm. You know this wave is there. Well, you, you could realize see Realize that other vendors are doing it out of the Mac market, too. Blue Chip and Hyundai, for instance, are going very strongly into uh, positioning themselves as a spokesman for this market. Uh, Tandy, quite frankly, I think, is the one that really mined the market. But, uh, but uh, the Mac is much in a much better position to, to mine this market because of their user interface. The Wouldn't you say so, Jerry? The majority are in the home right now, and professionals, educators, consultants, so forth have had but, them. But this visual interface that you just point to and click, it seems mm -hmm. to me, is, uh, for a new user, it's much less intimidating. Jerry. Yeah, the mm -hmm. It's less intimidating. Let me tell you something else also. Besides just the intimidating part of the icon, even things like the file management, trying to make your way up and down directories, uh, is so easy yeah. on the Macintosh yeah. and so arcane on the other systems. Uh, I want to get back to the show. <laughs> and, and Jerry, I know you told me you stopped at just about every single booth at the show. How, what would, how would you summarize the kind of highlights and trends you saw there? Probably the, the major areas that we saw uh, continue to expand here were for communications, for the peripheral devices, and uh, the vertical software especially. Jerry, which peripheral devices in particular? Well, the, again, there's a small subdivision. The laser printers, Apple's announcement, mm -hmm. and GCC for a product line of laser printers. Mm -hmm. We had the color monitors and monochrome monitors, and the graphics and video. So eight. 24, 32-bit mm -hmm. graphics cards, and then NTSC cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot and of large, an awful lot of large pieces. monitors at the show. Mm -hmm. A very, very crowded show. It was very vibrant. Do About you know that the, yeah, the first day open to the public, they had 20,000 people the first day, it set a record for a San Francisco show. Hmm. <laughs> Jan, what was your sort of summary? What were the highlights? What well, did I you think, see coming out of it? Uh, the major things that I saw from the show, and it's really hard to pick the major ones because yeah. there were so many, uh, I would say hypercard fever is absolutely evident in the show. Really? Yeah, absolutely evident. What, what you saw is Activision basically going in there and taking the chance on the market on their first two products, Focal Point and Business Class. But now you find uh, lots of others jumping in. Activision has two new products. The sales of the products are high. Uh, we saw several new ones. We saw Max Smarts. Uh -huh. We saw uh, HyperD which actually lets a 512K Mac at least mm -hmm. do browsing through HyperCard. We saw Hyper Bookmaker, and we're seeing an awful lot of vendors now jumping into that market now that Activision has sort of taken the first steps there. Jan, how about a magazine for the HyperCard? <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should mention that. Um, the first magazine for HyperCard was, in fact, unveiled by the, in the, at the show. It was unveiled by myself, who's publisher and editor of Hyper Age. You don't have enough to do these days. In my spare time, I do do that type of thing. Um, and of course, we feature really the, the players in the uh, in the Macintosh market. Uh, Danny Goodman writing uh, Organizing Your Life with HyperCard, and the uh, Ted Nelson doing a steady column on how he invented the word hypertext. So you, you don't think HyperCard might be a, a fad? No, I absolutely think HyperCard is going to revolutionize uh, the way computing is done and possibly even the way human thought is done. I, I, I think the concepts wow. for the past 40 years wow. have laid, laid the groundwork. <laughs> I really feel that way. The, the concepts since 1945 have been laying the groundwork in the literature, and HyperCard is such a seductive, simple, easy implementation from a company that knows how to reach the mass market. I think this is what's going to make it turn the corner. Jan, I really believe Jan that. Jerry George, we're out of time. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's our look at Macworld Expo. See you next week on The Computer. Chronicles. In the random access file this week, Microsoft announced it is designing a version of the OS2 operating system for 8386 microprocessor. Among the more dramatic changes to the system will be the support for an enhanced intelligent file system and support for multiprocessor PC systems. The company expects to release the 386 version in 1989. 
Word Perfect Corporation hopes to release version 5.0 of its Word Perfect word processing program for IBM PCs and compatibles in March. The most notable improvement is a new command that lets you integrate graphics into your document from a large range of file formats. Contrary to many expectations, Word Perfect Corporation did not incorporate the capability to have more than two documents open at one time. However, Word Perfect 5.0 can use expanded memory, allowing you to work on very large documents in RAM. And Lotus Development has unveiled an upgraded version of its word processor program, Manuscript, also to be released in March. Manuscript 2.0 features macros, integrated downloadable font support, and an automatic worksheet import. In addition, Lotus noted that Manuscript can now support several industry standard graphic file formats. Time now for this week's software review. Here's Paul Schindler. Kind of hard to tell what's going on at this size, right? Or at this range, you're too close to see the big picture. Well, a lot of people have the same problem with their tiny screen Macintosh computers. One solution is to spend $1,000 on a large screen monitor. Another solution is stepping out. Now, stepping out enables your Macintosh monitor to pretend it's just a window onto a much larger or much smaller monitor. You get to choose how big a virtual monitor you're using, but be careful, the larger the monitor you use, the more memory it takes up. Probably the handiest form of stepping out screen enhancement is the split screen, in which half the screen is either an enlargement or a reduction of what is on the other half of the screen. You can also use it to greatly ease navigation through a large spreadsheet. Stepping out is $95 for the Macintosh 512 SE or Mac Plus from Berkeley Systems Design in Berkeley, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Owners of CD-ROM players can now catch up on the past two years of news in the Soviet Union. Aldi Publishing of Minneapolis is offering a CD-ROM disc with an English translation of the Soviet daily newspaper Pravda. A comprehensive index allows users to find references to specific items or to use wildcard references for general searches. The Pravda CD-ROM sells for $249. Panasonic has come up with software for electronic typewriters called FastType that converts traditional Greg shorthand abbreviations into words, providing secretaries with a shortcut to finish typed documents. In addition to being able to translate, Greg shorthand users can create their own abbreviations. The software will be available for two models of Panasonic typewriters next month for under $200. Since most drunk driving arrests occur at night or on weekends, county officials in Grand Haven, Michigan, are considering using computers to allow judges to issue warrants from their homes for suspects who refuse to take breathalyzer tests. The proposal would allow an official at the county jail to send warrant information via modem to the judges for review. A judge could then swear on the officer by phone and instruct them to sign an affidavit warrant. Marine recruits at Paris Island, South Carolina are using smart cards from microcard technologies to buy everything from hamburgers to rifles. The 64K cards contain all the vital information about the recruit, including name and spending balance. The Marines are using the cards for all purchases on base. Finally, computers and religion have come face to face. Pope John Paul II has probably become the first pontiff to ever address issues of computer ethics. In a message prepared for the 22nd World Day of Social Communications in May, the Pope has warned the media against abusing the possibilities opened by computerization, which he said could be a force for peace if properly handled. That's it for this week's Random Access. I'm Cynthia Steele. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Transcripts of the Computer Chronicles are available online on CompuServe. Type Go Chronicles at any CompuServe prompt. If you'd like the CompuServe access number in your area or a free booklet describing how to use online services, call 1-800-848-8199.